Three books. For all the cultural weight that they have, and, and this is seen as the golden age of the railways, I'd actually debate that it was about 1910, but this is the golden age of the railways. This is where you get all the Art Deco posters that mm. go in coffee shops. Mm. They only actually lasted for 25 years right. because they, they were all nationalised in 1948. Yeah. Admittedly, we had the Second World War as well then. But so Those great 1930s designs, yeah. the things that they're, they're like Art Deco trains, yes. sort of. Yes. Uh, engines, you know. So this is, yeah. and actually, Flying Scotsman herself uh, is a product of the LNER publicity department. Because it's one of the fascinating quirks that because the LNER was absolutely brassic, didn't have two acres to rub together, they were, the, they were like the pioneers of modern marketing. So they were really, really good at, they were the ones who developed like the corporate image. And in fact, you know, the railway font that we use these days, yeah. which is kind of Jill Sands, but it's actually called transport. The LNER developed that in the twenties hmm. and then I they do all their corporate marketing in the railway font, which is why it, it, it triggers some nostalgic thing in our brain because it's been used for a hundred years now. Hmm. Um, all the corporate marketing and um, what they do with the corporate marketing, what they want is, um, clout and this is where the locomotion the original george stevenson locomotion number one has been on a plinth in darlington railway station since 1842 or something like that the they then bring her out um and in 1925 we have the centenary and but what they actually do they don't fire the engine up they actually put a little petrol engine in its tender and put some oily rags in the chimney and set really? fire to them. So there's a bit of smoke coming out the top. And then, of course, because it's a silent film, you can't tell. Because it, what it would actually be doing is thunk, 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 as it went down the railway. And put it next to um, one of the Northeastern Railway, Big Pacifics. Um, because right at the very end of the pre-grouping era, the, Nor the NER comes out with the Raven Big Pacifics. And the Great Northern Railway comes out with the A1s, of which Flying Scotsman is the first one built by the LNER. So they built one engine, they built one engine called Great Northern, and she comes out on like December the 28th, 1922. Right. And then Flying Scotsman is built in January 23, so she's the first one. Mm -hmm. And a Pacific is, uh, uh, is a wheel arrangement, it's a 462. So you've got four uh, little wheels at the front to direct it into and they just sit on their own little bogey so to direct it into corners to haul the front of the engine into corners and four wheels gives you great stability at speed six driving wheels in the middle they are six feet nine inches across they're huge wheels mm -hmm. uh for high speed long running uh gives you enough traction um but without making the engine too long and then what she's got, she's got two little wheels at the back, again, like the patentee, to support an enormous firebox. All right. So going right back to the start of mm. our conversation, Still there. Same the, the, idea. the big wide <laughs> firebox <laughs> is partly for your steam raising capability, because if you've got a big grate, you can have a big fire. And that means lots of steam. But it's also, as you're going from London to Scotland, that, that fire is covered, getting covered in clinker. So the fire is getting dirtier and dirtier and dirtier. So its its ability to raise steam is slowly going down. So there's literally no way of dealing with that during whilst the fire is still going. There is now. Oh, okay. But not uh, in not, the twenties. Okay, no. Um, okay. What yeah. you have to do is when you get to the other end, you have to work with the irons, which are like a massive long shovel, and a big long dart. You know, there's eight, nine feet long, made of an inch bar with a point on the end. And you have to go in through the fire rod door and sort of smash it all up into little pieces right. as best as you out. can and shovel it out. A horrible job. Yeah. Really horrible, nasty yeah. job and dirty job because all the ash, of course, it's, it's absolutely red hot. So the moment you take it out the door, it goes, Poof, and there's just dust everywhere and it <laughs> tastes horrible. Um, but if you've got a big wide firebox, you can get to Edinburgh before that becomes critical okay. um the lner marketing department get a hold of this they've done the centenary 
the LN, the LNER is the first, you know, the first railway in the world. We've been, they do the the Mercedes thing, you know, we mm. invented the car. Mm. Um, they get to claim that they invented the railway, so you should go by them. They also then do a a press non-stop run from Man from London up to Edinburgh, and after the railway races in the eighteen nineties. Uh, the absolute speed becomes less of an issue. I think it's because some of them got quite close to having quite a massive accident. <laughs> um, so they all sort of had a gentleman's agreement to actually back it off a bit. But the LNER rip up the rule book and they go, right, it's not going to take us eight and three quarter hours to get to Edinburgh. We're going to do it in six and a half. And everybody goes, well, that's quite, that's, that's going some. Um, the 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 really simple thing they do, and it's it's such a genius little thing. Was it? It used to be, you, it would take you, you know, four hours roughly to get to York. Crew change, and then you do the next four hours. Or back before then, it would be an engine change because you change companies. Running a steam engine continuously at high speed for that length of time is not advisable. So what they do is right, they come. Things start melting. No, the, the crew wears out. Oh, the crew. Yeah, the crew wears out. But the Your, shoveling of the shoveling of the coal and the sweat and the heat, and right. they need you know a pea and a sandwich. Um, right. So what Gresley comes up with is a corridor tender, and through the tender, under the bunker of coal and through the water tank, in the in the Flying Scotsman, there is a little corridor only about eighteen inches across, so you can shuffle in through it <clears throat> and then you open the little door into the cab and at speed you know the the scottish crew comes out gives the english chap a tap on the shoulder they swap into the seat and then he goes back through and then the first compartment in the first carriage is for the crew so he can sit there he can have a cup of tea and you know eat his sandwiches and, and job well done it now means he doesn't have to stop so they have a massive you know we've now not 25 percent out of the time it is to edinburgh amazing yeah um because back in those days of course edinburgh is the sort of second financial center in the empire after london there is a lot of anglo-scottish traffic mm. Mm. and up the eastern up the eastern coast you've got business chaps going to leeds you know middlesbrough tyneside all Durham, all these places up the massive centres of industry. Mm, mm. A massive amount of goods going up and down. And because they don't have Zoom, there are people do proper business trips. Mm. So a chap from Newcastle will go and see his his accountant in London. In per so there's an enormous amount of traffic going backwards and forwards. Big press trains like that get the get the railway traffic yeah. um and then so the scotsman does that in the 20s have the great depression in 1933 i think it is <clears throat> they strap her to the dynamometer car uh, which is a scientific test car um it's very clever actually they've got like a telephone connection to the cab so that the driver can report on um, reversal position, throttle position, uh, what the steam pressure gauges are telling him, how much water is still left in the tank, you know, how sweaty the farmer's getting, all the rest of it. <clears throat> and then on the dynamometer car, they've got a strain gauge on the couplings, so you can see how the engine's pulling. They've got a very accurately machined little wheel, um, so you can measure exactly how fast you're going and exactly how... Um, far you've gone up the railway okay. all this then feeds into a big telemetry thing with lots of nibs you know making wavy lines on the on a on a sheet of paper which is moving forward at like so two inches a mile or whatever it was so you and then you roll it all out and you can see exactly how the it, it's also used for like measuring the quality of the track so you can see if you suddenly get a bumpy line it's like right well the track gang needs to go out and fix that bit between mile post 201 or whatever it is um She's the, she's then the first authenticated engine to do over a hundred miles an hour, 
and it's only in 1933. Yeah. We hope you enjoyed that video, and if you did, please head over to lotusseaters.com for the full unabridged video.